This is AUGforums.com Real Talk, an unfiltered and independent perspective on Acumatica Cloud ERP. First, thank you to our sponsor, DataSelf and Velixo. Please take a minute to support this podcast by clicking each one of the sponsor banners located at AUGforums.com slash sponsors. Our sponsors track clicks, and every click helps to support this podcast. My name is Tim Rodman, and I want to mention two more things in this pre-recorded intro before we get started. First, I'm always looking for victims, ahem, I mean guests, on the podcast. If you use Acumatica in any capacity, no matter how small, I'd love to talk with you. Check out AUGforums.com slash podcast and click the link near the top of the page to learn about being a guest on the podcast. Second, I'd love to see you listed on my Rolodex. Check out the instructions at AUGforums at AUGforums.com slash Rolodex to see how you can add yourself to the list. All right, that's it for the pre-recorded intro. Let's get started. Today is Thursday, November 18th, 2021, and this is episode number 56. We've got Todd Coons with us from Acumatica. Todd, thanks so much for taking the time and joining us. I'll let you uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Well, thanks, Tim. Thanks for inviting me. I'm real excited to spend some time with you and talk through some of this stuff today. Yeah, a little bit about myself. Uh, you know, I guess just to I grew up in Centerville, Ohio, um, you know, and went to Centerville and then went to Wright State University and got my degree in management information systems, right, as sort of my, my first professional job, right, as we all have our uh, fun little jobs as we're going through school and all that stuff. But uh, I was a salesperson. Um, I need to get more um, IT based because I was selling high speed network cards. Uh, it was a really neat job. And uh, but I got into networking and did that for several years for um, children's services there in uh, Dayton, Ohio, and then moved to uh, Colorado and became an IT director for a manufacturing firm. They moved me around a little bit as uh, we got bought out, ended up being in New Mexico for almost five years, and then decided to get into business consulting. And that's when I started my ERP experiences and implementing customers and getting into distribution and job costing. And, and then uh, as a family, we decided we wanted to be closer to our um, my parents and, and my wife's sister and so forth. So we moved back to Columbus, Ohio and um, worked for as an ERP consultant uh, for uh, you know, 12, 13 years after leaving Dallas and then joined Acumatica. So I've been with Acumatica for over eight years now, almost eight and a half. Um, and Colin, um, worked for as an ERP consultant uh, for uh, you know, 12, 13 years after leaving Dallas and then joined Acumatica. So I've been with Acumatica for over eight years now, almost eight and a half, um, and started off at Acumatica running uh, our support and services. Actually, we didn't even have services at that point in time when I first joined Acumatica. Um, I was tasked to sort of change and, and make improvements with the support team. I spent a good year and a half with that. Uh, actually, which was really even more exciting for me was starting an office in Columbus, Ohio. We, you know, uh, the Yuri, who was the CEO at that point in time, you know, basically said, hey, I want you, you to put some plans together and figure out what you want to do. And we knew centralizing support was going to be key. Um, and I looked at uh, all four time zones and uh, at the end of the day, realized that Columbus, Ohio was the place. So I was real excited to be able to get that opportunity. And uh, it's not just support and services. We have developers, we have customer success. So it's been a, a really neat uh, ride through that process. But as I was able to get uh, support um, heading in the right direction, we realized that even though we weren't and we still aren't, nor are we going to be a, a services organization, you know, we're an ERP vendor, but you know, there was a lot of purposes behind a services team. You know, what kind of tools and things can we do to help our partner ecosystem uh, to excel and to learn Acumatica as quickly as possible. How can we help with the customer success and making sure we have high customer satisfaction? So even though a lot of things that you know we do are around helping our partners in doing implementations, 
the other side, which is uh, just as enjoyable and really neat, um, is that what kind of tools can we build as a service organization to help our ecosystem, our partners and our customers, what kind of programs, training material system, our partners and our customers, what kind of programs, training materials, uh, you know, like a, we're now getting ready to introduce something called project management as a service. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, customizations that we've done um, and now working on, a, you know, other tools to make Acumatica even easier to implement. So it's, there's a lot of things that we do as a service organization. It's not just delivering services to our partners and our customers, but it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun, real exciting. That's interesting uh, point about some of the tools, and I think we're going to get into one of those in a moment here. But um, I, I like, and, and and I'll mention that actually for those listening, I I used to work for Todd at Acumatica, and um, you know I'll I'll second the point that you kind of alluded to there that. Acumatic is not a services organization. I mean, it's sold 100% through the channel, but there's there's always the need to plug holes with services and it just help. And, and I saw that same thing when I worked there. But, um, you know, your point about building tools and things, to me, that's one thing I really like about the Acumatica platform. You've got the official product, which the uh, the official installation file, but then you have the capability to build really cool things. And it's not just for outsiders building those things, but it's, it's kind of interesting that even Acumatica ends up building these things. So you've got like the core development team, but then you've got a services team that's building things as well. And so there's what I think is a really neat mix of solid core and yet interesting things, even inside of Acumatica that get built around it. And um, yeah, I just think it's, it's, it's an interesting dynamic that um, you probably wouldn't have at a lot of different ERP companies. And, it, and, it, and you're right. And it is, uh, you know, I guess just to emphasize again, you know, we are 100% partner channel and, and our goal is to really sort of help our partners to be successful in growing their business. I mean, I, and I truly believe that we, when we, and it is, uh, you know, I guess just to emphasize again, you know, we are 100% partner channel and, and our goal is to really sort of help our partners to be successful in growing their business. I mean, I, and I truly believe that we, when we look at anything that we're doing, any new programs, any of those kind of things out there, our first our first checkpoint is how is this going to help the partner? How is it going to help our customers um, utilize the most out of the ERP system? And and it's not a we don't we don't we never really look at it is as a revenue driver. Um, that really never comes up as at any point in time. It's really what is it? What's it going to help to grow our partner base, grow our customer base, and um, and so that's you know key and most one of our most important goals um, from the services team. But you, and you're right there on the other part too, Tim, is that you don't see this a lot in other vendors or just even in companies where, you know, the services team, you know, there's a lot of things that we've built um, that we see that help, you know, track. And we might be able to talk about that a little bit later uh, based upon our timing. But, you know, the data migration tool came out of, you know, the import scenarios is, is a very, very powerful tool um, that's been with the product for a long time, but it has a lot of complexity to it. And it's not for the faint heart. Um, and it's gotten a lot better in the eight and a half years that I've been with Acumatica. And Tim, I know you're, you know, you being at Acumatica for a while, and then you were in the partner community. I'm sure you're very familiar with that tool. Um, but when we started trying to figure out how to allow your you know, the implementations to be more streamlined and to reduce business consultants' efforts in doing things, you know. They were spending a lot of time on import scenarios, even when they were simple. So we came up with a tool called data migration and, and how to make it simple. And that would fit a, a bigger group of people, but yet not get overly complicated scenarios, even when they were simple. So we came up with a tool called data migration and, and how to make it simple. And that would fit a, a bigger group of people, but yet not get overly complicated. So, yeah, so I think one of the really nice things, you know, out of this data migration tool, which really wasn't, wasn't our intention from the services team, ended up being the enhancements that engineering did to import scenarios, um, you know, turning on parallel processing, um, turn, you know, having these um, 
lists that it will do conversions. Um, so, you know, those were a couple things that we built into the tool and engineering looked at it and said, hey, you know, we can, that's a great idea. We see the benefits of it. And, and it sort of challenged our internal core team uh, to improve areas of the product in itself. But, uh, you know, to drop back more to talk a little bit more about the data migration initiative called Fast Track on with the idea of how do we get data into the system faster? How do we get customers into Acumatica quicker and start utilizing the system? And so uh, we built a, a framework that, that basically made it somewhat sort of very Acumatica-ish, right? It looks just like Acumatica. It uses the same grid filtering and all those different aspects. Um, but we were able to work around and not be bound by some of the limitations that are part of just the import scenarios, as powerful as it is. So we were able to actually still, even today, even with parallel processing turned on in import scenarios, we're still you know, 20, 30% faster than import scenarios. We don't run into the same memory constraints. But again, I, I'm not downplaying the import scenarios. It has still a very important role in, in a lot of um, areas inside the product, but the, the, the data migration tool, but the, the, the data migration tool is a little bit more simplistic. And, and, and what we've also done is we started off, our first round was just to be able to upload Excel. Um, and, uh, and that's where we wanted to start just to get some benchmarks, get some testing going on and seeing how things were going. And then what we did was, is that we actually have two systems that we have direct connects from. And one is Microsoft GP, where we get the database information, the SQL database information, and we pull directly out of the GP tables right into Acumatica. And then the other system is Stage 100. Now, right now we're only working with the Stage 100 SQL database, but we are in the process of working with um, and pulling data from the Providex. Uh, stage 100. And then we'll continue to add to it um, as, as we see and we get those demands. But it's been, um, you know, it's been a great learning experience on our end, but it's been real beneficial. Um, you know, we're able to get the data. We had the, uh, the pleasure and we've been looking for somebody with very large data sets. And, you know, normally speaking in the mid-market, you're looking at people that are bringing in maybe 20, 30, even maybe 100,000 customers or AR documents, AP documents. But we found an opportunity where we needed to bring in millions, uh, almost three to three and a half million customers. Um, we were bringing in almost eight million inventory items, and we were still able to get it done in a reasonable time frame. Um, and yeah, it still took a day or so to, to get that data in. Uh, you know, when you think about the, the volume of it and having to do all the validations, but considerably faster uh, than you would have to through import scenarios, which allowed the customer to, at the time of production and going live, allowed us to get up a lot quicker um, versus it taking weeks to get that volume of data in. So that's, that's pretty impressive. I, yeah. I, um, I'm curious some more on this and, and what triggered this production and going live allowed us to get up a lot quicker um, versus it taking weeks to get that volume of data in. So that's, that's pretty impressive. I, yeah. I, um, I'm curious some more on this and, and what triggered this episode initially was the data migration tool, although I'm sure you're going to have other stuff in your back pocket to throw at us. And um, as we were talking before we hit record, you know, I, I, I don't write down like a list of questions ahead of time, but a bunch are popping into my head as you're talking there about, about this data migration tool and uh, a couple of um, that I've got so far. One is um, it did what, what triggered it initially? Was it primarily speed? Um, I guess that's my first question. Or, or was it what, what was the, the first thing that that made you even start to think, hey, we should we should build a data migration tool? That uh, that's a little different than import scenarios. Was it speed, or was it having the pre-built integrations to other solutions? What was that initial thing? Yeah, but I go back and I think to that to answer that question. I think realistically, what drove it was an ability to pull directly from another system, right? Because that's really a huge time saver if we think about it. At the end of the day, if we could directly connect to any other legacy type system and get it into Acumatica quickly. Right. Without having the exercise of, all right, having the, the partner or having the customer worry about now, how do I get it out? And then making sure it's in the right format and then spending all your time in Excel. Right. Because that was another piece of it. Even though it might be easy to get the data out, 
once people got into Excel and using, and, and Excel is very powerful, but as we all experience, VLOOKUPs sometimes work, sometimes they don't. And it's easy to mess around with a formula too. And, you know, and we'd get the data and, and even using import scenarios, the data doesn't get validated until you run the validate or verified, right? Until you get it into the import scenarios and you run through that long process, right? Right. Until you get it into the import scenarios and you run through that long process, depending upon the size of the data set. So we were, so we were like, okay, great. Um, so how do we alleviate step number one and, and thinking, okay, great. Do we build something in Excel that looks into Acumatica that does all that validation? So that would, you know, sort of a, resolve one issue, but you still have the issue of pulling data out. So when we put all that together, we said, hey, you know, if we can, and this is why, you know, data migration has got its own box around it, and it really does, but it fits a good chunk of what's required. And we still have import scenarios that we can back it up with and, and when we're outside the box a little bit. But if we can alleviate the need for somebody to run reports or figure out the ways to get extract the data and just get it into Acumatica and then let the customer, because it's it's a simple enough tool where the customer can sort of do it themselves. And I'll talk about that here in a second. Get them into the system. They're learning about the system as it is, right? And they're seeing value in the system because they're in it and doing it, right? So part of it was how do we get the data out quicker and, and reduce some of the errors and issues that we were running into but the other mindset was, is we know if we can get customers utilizing the system, whether it's, per, you know, it's productive, but not actually in a productive environment, they're getting a lot more comfortable with it and actually helps the implementation process all the way along. And then- so, Since ahead. I'm most familiar with Great Plains, I wanna ask on that. How then do you, you know, Great Plains typically sits on a server somewhere, Acumatic is sitting in the cloud. So assuming, I guess, if does this work on a, SaaS Acumatica instance and somehow how does it punch through to get into the database where the Great Plains data is living? Yeah, and it, and it does, and we've done it, but we've done a lot of different ways, um, but it can work in a SaaS environment. You have to open up the SQL port and we've done it, but we've done a lot of different ways, um, but it can work in a SaaS environment. You have to open up the SQL port, right? To, to let, so that could become, some people look at that as a potential security hole. Um, it's not, but you know, it can be. So what we've seen in some cases that, you know, because you can have a trial version, you know, you can have it, you know, you take a snapshot, you, you, you load it locally, you do your conversion and get it into Acumatica and you take that snapshot and you push it back up, right? Or you get a database gotcha. and you push it back up. So there's a lot of different things when we run, when we, depending upon the customer's comfort level on opening up a SQL port. But at the end of the day, you know, you can, I mean, at any point in time, you know, you, there's always some type of a hole somewhere, right? Um, but you can lock it down pretty well. And um, and if you're just going to lock it down just for a certain period, of, you know, open it up for a certain time and then lock it back down again. Um, so, but it's not been a roadblock for us to this point. Yeah, that makes sense. You just open it up, import the data, then and then I'll let you keep going. Uh, is it? Are you completely bypassing import scenarios, or does the data migration tool kind of sit? on top of import scenarios from a technology standpoint? Yeah, another good question. You know, when we were first thinking about the design, um, you know, we were like, okay, great. How do we minimize the code, right? And for, you know, it's, you know, for us to even maintain, because as a services team, right? Because it's not, engineering's not doing it. So we have a smaller team and, you know, obviously we need to maintain it with every release um, and coming up with our own QA process and so forth. So we're like, well, Let's, let's try to base it off of import scenarios. And so we went down that way a little bit. And then what we found out is that we were then bound by some of the inherent limitations of import scenarios. So we said, you know what, let's, let's actually not use import scenarios and let's just create a framework tool from scratch and see if we can get, not use import scenarios and let's just create a framework tool from scratch and see if we can get better performance numbers um, and not you know, be locked down in certain areas. And that's the way we went. So it, that's what allows us to take better advantage of all the cores, right? The threads that are available. Um, that was one of the neat things I hadn't mentioned yet, but you know, we have a way of saying, hey, you have 16 threads or 32 threads. And, and in the preference screen, we can say, you know what? We're gonna do this during the day while other people are doing testing in UAT. So it's only use 
half of the threads, right? Or three quarters of them. And then maybe we just say, okay, great. Now we're doing some stuff in the evenings and weekends. Let's open up and take all the threads. Uh, so we have that flexibility of saying how much, how much of the CPU we want to use as we're doing that. So yeah, so we we just created, and uh, I'm going to give a call out to Ruslan. You know, he was the the brainchild behind um, the actual creation of the data migration framework tool, the data migration framework tool. Um, and the other reason why we went down that path was is that that gives us a lot more flexibility to build very simple data maps to legacy systems. So what we've done is because of the way it was designed. Um, we have now been talking to a lot of our OEMs and we've been talking to some international partners that, you know, have some not as common in the U.S. because that's, you know, obviously where we have a good chunk of our partners and our customers. Um, but, you know, sp speaking to Luxware and MYOB and I've showed them the tool and, and it gives, you know, they can use the framework tool, but now they can take sort of the mappings and within, you know, eight you know, roughly per screen, you know, eight to 12 hours, they can have, you know, a, a legacy system per screen mapped, right, by just using the data migration framework tool that we built. This is really interesting. And it, I, I've heard about, about the tool, how it actually works right now. And it's uh, really interesting. Good. So I, I guess one question I have there is, especially with the flexibility of it, would you, could, could it be described in that to me, import scenarios, and I know they, they've introduced some mapping functionality somewhat recently to import scenarios, but for the most part, I think of import scenarios as a, a load tool. Like if you think of ETL, extract, transform, load, mm -hmm. to me, import scenarios are primarily load. Um, is the data migration tool introduced a little more in the transform area, like being able to map things, maybe able to yeah. filter things out? Uh, making it a little bit more of an ETL tool. You think that's a good way to describe it? Yeah, I think it's an excellent way to describe it. And just and just to sort of share some features that sort of proves that out. I mean, obviously we're loading because we're pulling the data in. But, you know, within an Acumatica screen, and it looks just like, let's say the general transactions, it works. Like when we get error messages, like let's say like the customer class isn't valid or a state code or, or any of those things that Acumatica needs to validate, we actually put an error to that cell. So we actually have a box that it just lights up and the customer or the partner can actually see, hey, this cell is specifically wrong, um, which you can't necessarily do inside import scenarios, if maybe getting too technical because it's one big re, you know, text file at the end of the day, right? And you have to read through that whole process. Um, so you can't really just sort of call out a particular cell. But, um, and also inside the tool, we have like a find and replace and we can use a filter. So just like you can in Excel, when you hit control F to do a find um, and, and replace, we have that same capability saying, okay, look, in this column, we're looking for this value, replace it with this. And it will do, if it's 100,000 records, if it's a million records, and it'll go through and it will search the whole data set for that particular screen being, let's say, and it'll go through and it will search the whole data set for that particular screen being, let's say a customer, master customer record, and then it will convert all that stuff instantaneously, just like it would in Excel. The other really neat thing um, amongst a bunch of others is, is that translation. So all the master screens, so like accounts and sub-accounts, what we've done is that we've created a custom field called legacy account, legacy sub-account, if they exist in an ERP system. And that's the only two screens right there where you would then manually go in and say, hey, um, our old chart account code, you know, 1002 is now in Acumatica, maybe 10,000, right? Or vice versa, whatever the case may be. And we can do a one-to-one -one translation in our chart accounts and in our sub accounts. And, and then, and what's important about that is, is that now when we bring over accounts and in our sub accounts, and, and then, and what's important about that is, is that now when we bring over sales orders, purchase orders, AP bills, AR invoices, um, all those other transactional data, when that gets imported in, at that same time, it's translating it and it's looking and saying, hey, does this, val what is this value inside Acumatica and what should it be, or what was it and what does it need to be inside Acumatica? And so when you open up the screen, it shows you what was the originating value and then what is 
you know, sort of like a VLOOKUP, but it's a translation and it says, this is what the Acumatica value is gonna be. Um, so that's at the chart of account and sub account level, which is a huge time saver um, for bringing data over and cleansing it and cleaning it and, and takes away that always that hesitation when we're talking to CFOs and controllers and saying, no, I really don't want to change my chart of accounts because I'm familiar with it. Or, you know, it's a, it's a real big effort to translate all that and make sure it's correct when we're bringing it in. Um, and then, you know, what, so now that we've built this translation, it does it on the fly real quickly as that data is being brought into that data migration screen. And then as we get into some of the other master records, like customers, like vendors, like warehouses and inventory items, and there's a few others, but those are the main ones. You know, we, a lot of systems have a customer ID or a vendor ID or master, master ID. And then what we do is, is that, so we see what their legacy ID was, and then we actually use the segmented keys and we look to see, okay, great for customer. Is it going to be manually entered? So it's probably going to be the same value as it was in the legacy system, or are we just going to use the sequential ordering number, which we see a lot more today than you used to see in you know, a legacy system because of a lot of the searching capabilities that was not really there before, but now does exist. So what we do is that then if we say, hey, we're going to just use a sequential number, that then if we say, hey, we're going to just use a sequential number, uh, we go ahead and then take that segmented key and we go down as we're bringing that data in from GP or Sage, we're actually creating that next number and using that segmented key to increment it. And then when we say, hey, great, we validated everything was good, we're ready to bring it over into the customer master screen, we actually store both the new number and the old legacy number. And the reason why that's important is, is that when we start bringing in the old invoices and there's open invoices mounts, right? We wanna be able to automatically then translate that customer or that inventory item on the fly um, so they can see it. So there's, you know, they don't have to manually do anything. I um, like and, that. And it I saves like that. it saves a ton of time. It makes sure things are correct. Um, and, and it's just, it, it's really cool the way it works. And it's amazing how quick it is um, and, um, and the other real problem, right? Just <laughs> and you mute the phone thing. and then you laugh and then you unmute and say, okay. <laughs> exactly. You know, and, and, then, and then, and then, 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 the, then the next question comes in, great. How deep are your pocketbooks? Right. Because what exactly. you paid for, what you paid for the software and what you think you're going to pay for data migration now multiply that by 10 and that's what it's going to take. You know, so how valuable is that data? Um, you know, so what we did was, is that and this was one of the sort of the, other top reasons why we created this project because a lot of customers yeah they think and, and some for some cases that data is very valuable so they really have a couple of choices right it's one do i keep my old legacy system up and running and then i have to have two computers or multiple screens at, at a person's desk and then there's just the cost of keeping that old system up and hoping that it makes it before it completely dies right or whatever other security issues you run into because the system's so old your other option is great. Let's dump all this data out into some second person's desk. And then there's just the cost of keeping that old system up and hoping that it makes it before it completely dies, right? Or whatever other security issues you run into because the system's so old. Your other option is great. Let's dump all this data out into some second repository data source, right? Whether it's SQL or whatever the case may be. But now we have to create some other kind of reporting tool so that we can pull that data up, right? So we were like, great, well, what if we could actually have Acumatica be that data source, right? So Acumatica is true that date one, that true data source. They only have to live in Acumatica. They don't have to look anywhere else. So we said, great, well, let's build, instead of bringing it all into Acumatica, and, and when I say Acumatica as in the real transactional screen, so like the customer master, the AR invoices, because you have to do a lot of data validation. Um, and then sometimes you just need to make sure that all the numbers tie and all those things. At the end of the day, when we were always asking about the data, most people just said, well, I just want to be able to look cleansing. It doesn't really have to have a whole lot of bonds to anything. So we're like, we built actual legacy tables and we call it legacy historical tables. So the data is unscrubbed, but it still does the translation, right? So it will match to a new chart, new chart of accounts. It'll match to the new customer. It'll match to the new inventory item. And then we provide a data access class with that so that then if, and we haven't gotten to the point of building reports and smart panels because customers and partners can do that. But now because we have brought in all that legacy historical data in a raw format, they can see how it originally was. 
and they can still tie it to any of the Acumatica screens with a smart because of the customer has the the new customer ID and it has the legacy in that master record field, um, which then provides even more value to be able to find that legacy data if you really truly need it. So does this this sort of sounds to me like you you're bypassing the screen because you're dumping it into a custom table. Does this this sort of sounds to me like you you're bypassing the screen because you're dumping it into a custom table, which makes sense. So you you don't have to get tripped up by all the extra validation logic. So you're just dumping it there to your point to have a place to to store it. But then did you just say that you can somehow then call it up easily from screens rather than having to go to that, like a custom generic inquiry or something? You can, but you'd have to build that smart panel or GI, right? We don't, we ah, haven't built- That's the smart panel part. Okay, yep, yep, that yep, makes yep. sense. Yep, yep. We haven't built those out yet. And we're, we're looking at that right now more of the, and that's where I sort of threw in that comment, partners and customers do that. We provide the data access class. So partners can build a GI or build a side panel. Um, on, on a customer screen or on the vendor screen if they needed to do so, right? Um, and then, but it is, it's just, it's a, I like to sort of just say it's a raw data dump into a custom legacy table inside the Acumatica. Just say it's a raw data dump into a custom legacy table inside the Acumatica database and they can do whatever with they want with that data with because we build that data access class to that custom table. So I've got another scenario, which I, think the answer is probably no, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Sure. Um, and, and I like the scenario because I think it makes a ton of sense in that Acumatica has got pretty decent reporting tools out of the box. Right. And, um, you know, although myself, I still end up going out to BI tools just because I think they're more powerful, but I, you could still do a lot in Acumatica. And at the end of the day, a lot of times you just need to get the data in and you're almost using Acumatica as a data warehouse in this situation for this legacy data. But I think there's also other scenarios where you've got other random data, like a client I've been working with recently, we brought their call data into Acumatica. It's an outside phone system that is an outside phone system that keeps track of phone calls and numbers called, numbers uh, received calls from, and they wanted to report on it in Acumatica. So we did a similar thing, built a custom grid, dumped the data in there. Um, it is the, coming bring back to the data migration tool, is there a way to kind of define your own tables in there or are you limited to those legacy tables that, that exist already? Um, good question. Right now it is limited to what we've provided. Now, if, you know, eventually, uh, and I, I want to be cautious the way it says, you know, right now the tool is something that we as Acumatica Services, we offer that as a service to our partners at a very, very low cost um, to the point that the partner can't do the data migration, you know, get it, go through the process twice, work with the customer um, cheaper than, than what, you know, we're able to do it for. Long term, I do want to be able to give the tool out um, and, but the, where we're then all of a sudden now we need to support it, right? It is software. There's, you know, people are going to run in different situations and we just don't have the resources and the bandwidth to be able to support the whole partner community by relinquishing that. Um, but can we, we've done some customizations to it to do things similar um, that what you're referring to. There have been, you know, like that big project I was talking about, they actually had a, an ISV solution that required uh, some custom tables and do some different things. So there are ways to do it and do it quickly. Um, you know, it's just really, what do we need to store and how do we need to do it? But it's not designed in the way that it's real simple for a partner or customer to, hey, create this custom table and boom, go. I like the idea and it's probably something we'll, we'll revisit and, and look at um, in a later release at some point in time, but today it does not. But it sounds like what you might have already is, hey, I still need to go out and create that customization project to create those custom. And what I look at um, in a later release at some point in time, but today it does not. But it sounds like what you might have already is, hey, I still need to go out and create that customization project to create those custom. And what I've typically done is just like a grid, like the chart of account screen, where mm -hmm. it's you know just a grid with columns and rows hooked up to a custom table with a custom data access class. It sounds though like, you know, even though I have to do that part, maybe I could still connect that thing to the data migration tool. So I get all the benefits of importing into it. And you, and you very well could, 
without a doubt. And it's, it's designed. I mean, that's why there's there's sort of two, uh, without getting too techy, there's sort of two layers, right? There's the, the and that's why earlier on I was calling it a data migration framework tool. And then there's the second level of, inner, you know, the actual mapping to the Acumatica screens, right? So it's almost sort of like, if you think about just Acumatica stuff, we have the core data pulling in and then, you know, having some access inside Acumatica. So it, it could vary, it could be considerably less, a little bit more, but that's sort of what we're seeing. So at the end of the day, answering your question, it could be done, yes. And what about another scenario here that might not really be the same thing, but I, I see kind of two things. One is, I think it's appropriately, you're referring to it as a data migration tool, because that's a like a one-time thing. You're getting off a system and you're getting on to Acumatica. But then there's also the situation where maybe I'd call it data integration. Like I'll go back to that call data example where they're making phone calls every day. And so every day they still have an ongoing need to import that data in Acumatica. And um, you know, I think that the challenge is there is you get into APIs and every system's got their own set of APIs. But um, I, I, I find that, I, I, I find that Excel still comes back into play in this situation a lot. Uh, because you can have someone just every morning go dump the data to Excel from that other system and import it into Acumatica. And I think it comes down to frequency there. If it's every morning, that gets to be kind of painful. If it's just once a month, it's not too bad. But where I'm, I'm circling in here uh, with import scenarios, I, I know I can do some scheduling of like, hey, go out and look in a folder for an Excel file and import the data that's in that Excel file into Acumatica. Um, I've hit some challenges with it. And part of it could just be my knowledge and understanding of it. Like some feature that I'd like to see is import the Excel file and then archive it somewhere and then wait for another one to land and only import if there's something in that folder. And then if it gets archived and there's nothing there, don't run an import. In that type of... Uh, a folder that's constantly changing where I'm now just not migrating, but I'm really in a, an integration that's constantly running scenario. Uh, have you seen any, any tips or tricks around there or anything that the data migration tool might be able to help with? Yeah, the, the data migration tool isn't necessarily, definitely isn't designed to, to do something like that. I mean, we could probably come up with some things, but what, when we've had those type of requests, we've normally come up and you're right, there are some limitations around the import scenarios. Uh, what we've done, though, I've seen two two ways to address. One, as you alluded to, is we have our web services and APIs, and just build that integration, right? If if you have that option, um, obviously that's. I would like to say, generally speaking, that's your cleanest and best way and most consistent way. The other thing that we've done, though, is is that we've actually built, and it was several years ago, and we haven't really seen the request come around much, but um, we've actually built a customization that goes out, it uses the done though, is, is that we've actually built, and it was several years ago, and we haven't really seen the request come around much, but um, we've actually built a customization that goes out, it uses the import scenarios, but it goes out and it searches an FTP folder or some location, and it looks at the file, and then it does a comparison, and it looks to see, is there any data, what da, 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 and then it decides at that point, because it's a custom screen, how to treat it. And then what it'll do then is it'll take that file after it gets done reading it, and then it will dump it into um, a, a backup folder. So then it removes it out of that folder if we need to, and puts it someplace else so you don't lose the originating data. Interesting. And then you just do the normal import scenario on top yep. of that. Yep. Ah, another so one of those myriad of tools, I think, that, uh, that, that you've built there over the years, right? That, um, yep. you know, should, should they be used a second time or not? I think is the question. And to your point, then it's gotta be supported. Uh, but that's-, that's right. And they've all been different, you know, and that's been, that's been one of the neat things on, at least on the customer customization part of the services team is that, you know, we'll get these requests, you know, and a lot of times like, you know, and that's what, you know, we have, you go out to portal, you can create a, you know, customization request and, you know, I think there's a lot of value just to even to say, hey, if you guys created something like this, but, you know, if we start seeing patterns, we do have a lot of partners that use us for customizations just because they don't have other development resources. And, and that allows us to see 
repeating patterns. Um, and it helps us in two ways. One, if we've already built something, right, then we can let the partner slash the customer know. But then the other aspect of it is, is that when we start seeing repeating patterns like that, we also share that information with the product team. And then it helps drive a little bit the roadmap, right? Because if we start seeing a lot more reoccurrence of that topic, we're like, hey, we're seeing this quite a bit. This probably should be something you might want to put into the corporate team. And then it helps drive a little bit the roadmap, right? Because if we start seeing a, a lot more reoccurrence of that topic, we're like, hey, we're seeing this quite a bit. This probably should be something you might want to put into the core product. And then they'll look at our functional design. They'll look at our code. And, you know, there's still a lot of work that they need to do to get into the core product. Um, but, but so that's one of those other ways that, you know, we help contribute um, or our voice, I guess I should say more than anything from the partners and the customers on when we start seeing regular requests of hap- helping the product team determine their roadmap. Yeah, I, I think that's an excellent point that, that kind of repeating things and themes that you're seeing. And that's, I think, a point that a lot of people don't consider when they're considering, you know, do I just go outside for a developer? Do we talk to Acumatica and they just compare hourly rates maybe? but maybe they're not considering that, that other angle, just the volume of, of things and similar things that you see. You know, we need this customization and we might have something that's close and, and say, okay, great. Well, maybe if, you know, if we took this and we have to make maybe you know, this tweak, that tweak and that tweak, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we're not charging, you know, not, I know this isn't a discussion about you know, billing and all that kind of fun stuff, but we don't sort of take that customization and say, okay, great. Now here was what that effort is. Plus then here's the extra effort, right? Um, you know, we'll turn back around and just say, okay, great. What's the new effort. And, and then a little bit of what, what's it going to take to upgrade, at least upgrade that code to the version that they need to. And so it ends up being cheaper. I mean, we do everything, we do everything as a fixed fee. Um, I've, I mean, I bought into the Kool-Aid a long time ago before a lot of partners have. And I, there's, it's definitely very customer centric and most customers are ecstatic when they hear that, you know, Hey, fixed fee. And we're seeing a lot new part, a lot more partners coming in and, and agreeing that to go um, because at the end of the day, and this becomes another topic we can get into Tim at a later time, but um, you know, where is, where is services and sort of how does that sales cycle what role does services really play nowadays as in the dollar revenue to a business versus in the past, services was a huge driving factor and software is a small portion of it. But now with SaaS and so forth, that revenue model has changed and it's really more that software is need to be what is the driven factor and not focus as much on the services dollars because the services isn't reoccurring, um, but that SaaS license is. But I, I diverted and went down a little bit of a, a different rabbit hole on you, so. I like rabbit holes. <laughs> You're talking from Acumatica standpoint, right? And that, no, I, just even from the partner standpoint. Oh, interesting. Or like yeah. building pro- add-on products and things of that nature. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. You make your core something that's recurring and something that to, in a sense, kind of give some of that stuff away and that you're sitting on top of a a product that's a SaaS product, right? So maybe that's a little more built into the business model there. Yeah. So quick time check here. Um, I know you're a super busy guy and I want to respect your time. Got about 10 minutes left here. Um, We had a couple other things on our list that we bat around on email. Um, Whatever, whatever you think we have time for and whatever's most exciting to you. I know we had talked fast track implementation. You mentioned a little bit, we could keep going down the cool customizations direction. Uh, What do you think? Yeah, I would fast track while we could probably talk I know I could talk days on, on fast track and just for sort of the whole idea behind it and, and how it's just helped transform just implementations in itself and, and how it got started and where it's going and all the really neat stuff there. So I, I, don't, I don't know in 10 minutes I could do it. It's due itself and, and how it got started and where it's going and all the really neat stuff there. So I, I, don't, I don't know in 10 minutes I could do it. It's due, dot, due diligence. I might be able to wet some whistles and, and entice people to listen to the next time around. But, you know, I think maybe we can, I can call out a few customizations um, in the time frame that we have that I think are sort of neat. Um, you know, one, uh, we did a, and this was, and this goes back to sort of the services team initiative and really what is, 
what is our core purpose? And we actually ended up, and it started off of, we created something called WooCommerce um, integration. So everybody's familiar that, you know, we have now have Shopify and big commerce, but I'm not sure as everybody knows is that the con there's a commerce sort of framework that sort of core, and it goes back to sort of like what we did with the data migration and, and, and Acumagra has that core platform, right? Commerce did, had the same thing. They came up with a design commerce framework, and then it makes it easier to connect to other commerce sites, right? Um, so you're not rebuilding the base core that everything has, but you're just sort of really building that specific integration to that particular um, commerce site. So one of the initiatives was, and we started seeing more and more requests coming from WooCommerce. So we said, hey, you know what? As a, to build out a tool to explain, maybe to show other partners, one, how easy it is, and two, if they really wanted to get into commerce. And because obviously there's hundreds, if not thousands of different commerce sites out there, how they could go about and, and do this themselves. So we, we, grabbed a, we grabbed a small little team um, you know, it had a project manager, it had a couple of BAs, uh, a couple of product specialists, a QA person, and a developer. And, um, and we actually built out a sort of a whole program that sort of was packaged in days, uh, a couple of product specialists, a QA person, and a developer. And, um, and we actually built out a sort of a whole program that sort of was packaged and says, hey, here's sort of a, a canned project plan. And here's, you know, a lot of the questions that you should be paying attention to and watching and, um, you know, asking as you go down and creating a minimal viable product or MVP. And, and then we developed something out. And, and so now, you know, it went really, really well. Um, you know, the team worked really well together. Uh, we were able to get something together and, you know, and, um, you know, we, if I remember correctly, it might be out on GitHub, but it, it went so well that now uh, we're looking internally, the engineering team's looking at it internally and saying, hey, I think we're close enough that we might just be able to build this as an integration inside Acumatica. So now like we have Shopify and BigCommerce, you know, we, you know, there's a chance that we're gonna have another. So we were real excited about that. I'm real proud of the team, um, but that, you know, that again, sort of shows a lot of things that the services team does um, has a lot of impact throughout the ecosystem directly for the partners and the customers, but also internally for our engineering um, all the way around. So, so yeah. I didn't so, know you guys built that. That I actually, I use WooCommerce on AUG forums. It's just a WordPress site. And I use WooCommerce to accept all my payments via credit card for okay. the consulting work. And I, I like it because it's one, it's free <laughs> and it's very flexible. And I, I, I'm curious if you've seen this, I feel like a lot of, especially manufacturers, they just are, don't even want to deal with the website at all. They don't even know what it is uh, if, from an e-commerce standpoint. And, you know, they're just, they got their distribution channels and they're still like taking orders on the phone and they're still taking check payments, a full blown implementation, but it's maybe a way to kind of introduce it to someone like an old school manufacturer. Are, are you mm -hmm. seeing that at all? Um. You know, it, I, working with sometimes in that kind of atmosphere, I'm not as familiar with, at least in this request, um, to, you know, to be real candid. I mean, it came across, Ali said, hey, we're, we're seeing a lot of crest around this. You know, what do you guys think about building this out? And I said, hey, I think it'd be, you know, I think it'd be great for the team to learn and, um, you know, sort of be a good training, but, you know, it does contribute to the partner community. Um, which, you know, obviously is one of our initiatives. So we just sort of built it out. Um, we really relied a lot on the commerce team um, to help us sort of see, you know, finding beta sites, making sure and testing out, make sure all that stuff really works. But um, so I don't know exactly, you know, I, why WooCommerce sort of came up, what was the real push outside of it's free? And we were seeing a lot more requests. Why WooCommerce sort of came up, what was the real push outside of it's free? And we were seeing a lot more requests behind it. Um, but you know, so that was, that was sort of, I guess to put all my cards on the table, it's sort of how it came about. So it shows a little bit of, you know, sort of not my understanding the whole driving reason why we picked WooCommerce. That's interesting. And, and even if, yeah, who knows what really drove it, but I still wonder if it's a, a good use case for it, you know, and that, yeah. especially like for a manufacturer, you're not dealing with 
super high volumes. You've got like your, your end distributors, but just to digitize that process, right. Yeah. Uh, would be huge. And even if you're just dealing with B2B and a lot of times the Acumatica customer portal is a little too rigid and you have to cut, do heavy customization, or I'll use the word heavy, you know, to, to change the way it works. Whereas a WordPress site is just a lot more flexible. Uh, it, it doesn't deal with yeah. high transaction volume as well, but you right. know, it's free and it's, it's easier to move things around and uh, yeah, transaction volume as well, but you right. know, it's free and it's, it's easier to move things around. And uh, yeah, that, that's, I, I had no idea you guys built that. That's really cool. And I, I think it's cool that, you know, we didn't mention this already, but even that Acumatica uses Acumatica internally for your own ERP system. That that's one area where you're your own customer. And yeah. here's kind of like another area where you're your own customer. Cause now you're, you're building on the Acumatica product as a customer in a sense on the services team, right. Rather than as the development team. And I just think that interaction is, is really, really interesting and really powerful in an exponential kind of way, you know? Yeah, no. And, and it is, and I'm glad you pulled that, you, you pointed that out. I mean, maybe a lot of people don't know. I mean, we, we do use Acumatica. Um, you know, we drink our own champagne um, and it is, you know, as we use it as a, you know, development shop services, sales, you know, a lot of things that actually go into the product are based upon things that, you know, we sort of struggle with. How do we, you know, we do look at outside systems, right? We, you know, we try to use a little bit of best in class. What can we integrate with? But, you know, is there, we, we, we always evaluate and say, hey, could our partners and our customers get any benefit out of it? And does it make sense for us to add features to the core versus trying to find some third party? So there, there's a lot of projects. There's probably two or three easily every year internal stuff that, that we work on and that we do that um, we really end up building out that if we get the opportunity and we start seeing a demand for it, we package it in a way as a customization. So we, we actually have a lot of customizations in our internal system and, uh, and we can take those and, you know, redistribute them if, if, if we see a need and a demand for it. And the best way for people to do that, if they, I think you mentioned in our internal system and, uh, and we can take those and, you know, redistribute them if, if, if we see a need and a demand for it. And the best way for people to do that, if they, I think you mentioned earlier, you, even if it's just a, an inquiry as to, hey, have you done something like this before? That would be in the partner portal and there's a, like a customization request area in there, right? There is. And, and yeah, thanks for pointing that out. So yeah, if you go to community or you go to portal, I know right now, you know, it's in a couple of different spots, but that will get resolved here um, sooner than later. But um, there's a new customization case and you just sort of say, hey, I'm, I'm, you know, have you all done anything like this? Or here's a custom customization request we have. We do on Portal have um, like design document templates uh, that we ask partners to fill out to at least uh, to give us a background, sort of what they were thinking uh, to get us going in the right direction. And then if we have stuff, then um, being a lot more companies doing repair warranty type work. And, you know, in the past, everybody was using field services. Um, we actually built the tool around using uh, CR, or case management system and sales orders uh, so that you know, the customer didn't necessarily also have to buy field services unless they needed to. Um, and we're, we're seeing a lot of momentum, a lot of requests around that tool, and, it, and it's really cool. So, you know, when we've got stuff like that, when people make those requests, um, you know, if we've got them, we'll, we'll, we show demos, we'll send the design documents so they can sort of see what the purpose behind it is. If they think there's interest in it, then we can do some demos and go down that path. Yeah, that reminds me. I, I think I might have seen a Doug Johnson demo on that repair warranty. I'll go out and find it and link to it on this episode. Is there anything that you're aware of for the data migration tool yet that might be out there for I, a demo? I don't have anything out there yet. Um, I've always, it, it's been more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation and obviously it's not scalable. We've, we've continuously added to it quickly and it just, as it's growing, I was like, all right, great. I could do a video now. And then I'm like, nope, well, these two things are going to come out in the next month. And I was like, do I want to redo the video then? And da, 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 da. So you know, it's how often it's finding the bandwidth, right? To do I do the video now, knowing that we're going to add a bunch of changes, and so I just haven't gotten to that point yet. I have the same struggle when I'm deciding when I sit down, I'm going to make something. Do I do audio or do I do video? Because things change so much, and the video becomes obsolete so fast. 
That's yep. actually one reason I like this podcast. It's I think you can you can get into a conversation and really get an idea of what's out there. And it's just a lot faster to record this, know where things are at, know where to go if you want to find out more about it and get that information out there. That's why I was thrilled to be, you know, to get you today. I know you're super busy and you know, get get some of Todd Kuhn's brain for an hour. This this has been great. <laughs> well, thanks. No, I I really enjoyed it. And yeah, busy and you know, get, get some of Todd Kuhn's brain for an hour. This, this has been great. <laughs> well, thanks. No, I, I really enjoyed it. And yeah, it, you know, we, and we've, we've run in that battle, even like with training material, right? Do, you know, a lot of people like to watch stuff, but as soon as you, somebody has their eyes to use and people learn, learn well that way, but as soon as a colors, I mean, it could be as simple as a color change. Well, it doesn't match my system. And, and, and then all of a sudden yeah. they're, completely, they're completely, Oh different. yeah. And we all do it. It's not just customer. I mean, we just, we all, we see something that doesn't match exactly. And all of a sudden our brain starts to shut down. Well, this obviously doesn't match what I have, right? Yeah. What else is different that I'm not yeah. seeing? Oh, absolutely. Exactly. And the amount of work that goes into producing videos, a lot more than oh. just talking about it. <laughs> exactly. This is definitely a lot easier. And it's a lot more fun too, right? You know? Agreed. Yeah. The low, low prep, no prep, kind of like low code, no code. <laughs> exactly. 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 So... But um, yeah, you know, another, you know, a couple other, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, but um, yeah, you know, another, you know, a couple others just real quick. I know we're, we're Oh, Hey, if you more, got but, time to keep going, I got time. Uh, yeah. Keep uh, going. You know, we did, uh, um, which is interesting when we started researching, um, you know, obviously Acumatic is big in the construction space and growing um, exponentially. Uh, we got this request and it's called an S curve um, for construction. And, you know, what was interesting is, is that all of a sudden we, we started talking about it and it was very, it's very popular and very demanding outside of the U S for some reason now, and it could be a small sampling that we have too, but as soon as we started talking about it, even sharing with the construction team, you know, it became more of, well, yeah, we, yeah, we heard about it, but it's, it's not really that much required here. But, you know, when we start talking to construction companies in Canada, or we start talking to construction companies in Asia, I mean, it all has become a, why isn't this part of the product type of a thing? So why isn't this part of the product type of a thing? So what is an S-curve? It, it basically, um, it, it looks like a graph and it has, it looks like an S, right? Um, and there's multiple ones, but it sort of watches your, whether it's based upon hours or time frame, um, it shows you sort of what your original plan was, your original schedule or your origi original plan to consume hours versus your actual. And then it also takes into impact. So it's, here was my original. Now, if I have change orders, I have a different line. So it has a little bit different of an S curve. So you can actually sort of monitor and see how you're doing versus your original plan versus your new plan. And are you getting ahead or behind? Are you going to be able to, are you... Are you going to go over budget? You're going to go under budget and so forth. So it's a neat graphical representation of how a project's moving along and what it, and what it should be doing um, into the future time period, whether that might be weeks or months or however the case may be. You know what? Another thing that has come up, and, and I've actually pushed for this um, a couple of years ago, and, uh, and I, always, I just get eyes that just roll and say there's no real need for this, but um, is on the general ledger transaction screen and being able to, you know, restrict or sort of do like an approval process, right? Um, so there are some ways that you can, you know, if you go out to community, there's actually some, there's a couple of threads that talk about it and doing some different things. We ended up creating a customization that if you had access rights to release, you just couldn't release your own batches. So if you think about, you got a lot of people at a different level and they can approve or release things, but we just wouldn't let people release their own batches. Somebody else would have to go in and do it. So we thought that was a really cool uh, customization that we did for our, for journal entry screen. So it's like a user specific field level security in a sense. Um, it's like field level yeah. security on the button. So we thought that was a really cool uh, customization that we did for our, for journal entry screen. So it's like a user specific field level security in a sense. Um, it's like field level yeah. security on the button, it, it uh, is. but it knows who the user is. That's interesting. It knows who the user is. And it just says, Hey, I saw that you, you were the one who created this batch or, you know, and we're not going to let you release it. We got to find somebody else to do it. Simple solution. You're, you're probably 90% of the way there to what people are looking for. I like that. Yep. Or maybe hundred yep. percent. Yeah. That's cool. Um, 
Oh, and this doesn't solve this. This doesn't tend to be for a large group of customers, but we are seeing more and more of this with, um, especially with having multiple tenants and so forth. And some of our more enterprise type customers, where they'll have multiple tenants um, because they are different in the way they want to set them up. And and this will change a little bit now that Acumatica has is rolling out, right? Allowing to have multiple base currencies inside of something wanted to keep individual tenants and, but they were all in different currencies. And so taking a snapshot and then there really was no easy way to change that base currency. So we created a customization that they could take a snapshot and then they say, Hey, change my base currency from this to this. It actually goes out and verifies that there's no transactions in there. As long as there's no transactions in it, it'll actually just go ahead and update all the appropriate tables so that they can make let's say it was a Canadian based snapshot and they needed to make it pesos. And, and so they can do so um, at a click of a button very quickly. Interesting. Um, there's no kind of public, I don't think there is, but there's no like public log out there, right? You got to create the, the customization request to yeah, find there, out what kind of goodies you have in there. <laughs> yeah. There isn't a public log yet that, you know, one thing, there are a couple things that, you know, there are some initiatives that we're trying to, to do. You know, there's the marketplace where we're trying to look to see, hey, do we put some stuff? <laughs> yeah, there isn't a public log yet. That you know, one thing, there are a couple things that you know, there are some initiatives that we're trying to, to do. You know, there's the marketplace where we're trying to look to see, hey, do we put some stuff out there? We like to contribute to GitHub. Uh, you know, I can't emphasize that one enough. You know, I know we originally started GitHub several years ago and sort of trying to hope that, you know, we could prime the pump and, and we would continue to put, and there's a lot of great customizations out on um, GitHub that are free, right? Um, but, you know, again, it's a community supported system. So, you know, it needs to be, you know, if the partner wants to upgrade or make it work for a version, you know, it's, they're, they're required to do so. Now they can, ask us to do it and they can create that customization case and say, Hey, I've got this. Can you upgrade it? And we'll charge a fee to upgrade it. But at the end of the day, you know, there's a lot of neat stuff out there. So some of these things that we do put out there to try to say, Hey, you know, we think that there's some really good stuff out there. Like, and this is a really old one. And I don't know how many, but you have a customer that has a leftover balance and they're saying, Hey, pay me a check, you know, pay me some, um, my balance left over instead of, you know, the manual way without the customization, you have to go create the vendor. You got to credit out the, um, or actually, yeah, you got to create an invoice to remove the balance off of the customer account and then you have to create an AP bill so you can pay it. We actually, there's a customization that just lets you cut a AR check back to your customer. Um, so there's a lot of really neat things out on GitHub. And, you know, that's, that's one thing too, just in general that we talk about internally quite a bit is, you know, there's a lot of great data that, um, that we provide. And, and I hear that quite a bit as we onboard a lot of people. Um, and, 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 and Acumatica has just grown. I, I mean, the number of people that we are hiring every year, especially even during the pandemic, it's just been astronomical and surprising. I, yeah, think. I didn't realize you had 35 in Columbus already. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, you know, and you know what, right. I was the first, you know, and you know what, right. I was the first person on the services team and we have over 30 some odd people on the services team um, from business consultants to developers to functional consultants. I mean, just all over the place. So it is, it's, it's just amazing on, on the growth and the, and the support that we get just all the way around. But, but yeah, GitHub's got all kinds of stuff out there. You know, there's good stuff on portal. There's good stuff on community. Um, you know, and we're trying to, we're really sort of hoping and focusing on community really being more of that one spot where we can get all the, you can go to just one spot and get that information that, and instead of having to search all over the place, but so it is Actually, an initiative that, on our start. That, that makes sense to me Just starting a discussion thread on community.acumatica.com. Hey, here's something we built, describe it a little bit. Yep. And then you're just starting a discussion, right? Then it, you know, the discussion is going to evolve, but then at least it's, ex it's exposed to a Google search. You might be able to throw some screenshots in at some point, at least people know there's something there, Fifty percent of what someone needs or whatever percent, at least they're not starting from scratch. And that's a big deal. Yep. And then, and, and, and then, and, and, and we've thought about that and I'm, I'm glad you, you, you see that as a, as a very valuable communication tool. And, and that's been something that I talk about every year within the team. And then all of a sudden it says, okay, great. Now, if we post that, what's the time, you know, how much time do we spend, can, you know, keeping up to that when people ask questions and have to go back and so forth. And then everybody having the bandwidth, um, you know, to, 
and that, and that's a that's a battle that we all deal with, right? And is just bandwidth and and having a good work life balance at the end of the day. Um, and that's been a big thing that you know at Acumatica we we really are focused on quite a bit um, and and trying to do our best. So. You know, we, we, we try to be very cautious of taking on and, and starting something and making sure that we can do it right versus just doing something sort of half fast. Right. So we have to, yeah, those are a lot of, those are a lot of decisions that we try to make and make sure that we can maintain it and keep it going. So. Can I ask you real quick on GitHub since you brought that up? Um, yeah. I'm out of date on this, so I might be wrong. So, or you might not even know, but I, I remember seeing at one point, Part of my concern with GitHub was that, like, I'll give a shout out to another one uh, on there is the lot attribute customization. Oh, yeah. Uh, Deer and put that one out there. Another awesome one. But I know part part of the concern with that is, hey, I'm I'm now going to uh, rely on essentially open source software for part of my business. And I thought I remember seeing at some point that uh, this, maybe it's the services team that would actually enter into some kind of support contract to upgrade it, uh, fix it if it breaks, so that you at least have a supported piece of software, not just something you downloaded off of GitHub. Is that, do you know if that's still the case? No, that's, that's definitely the case. All our, and I'm glad you bring that up. I mean, every customization um, endeavor. And what we also do then is we, we provide the option of a annual, what we call support and maintenance. Um, and it's on anything on GitHub, whatever the case may be. Um, we've even gone to the point of we've taken, you know, partners of written code and they said, we can't maintain this. Will you maintain it for us? And then we'll look at it and then we'll provide, you know, we make sure it follows our internal Acumatica standards. Not that partners aren't writing good code. So I don't want to make that message to get out, but you know, there are partners out there that do a really good job, but we have our own standards internally too. And, um, and so we'll look at it. We'll make sure it's, you know, it's something that we can maintain. And then we'll provide an annual maintenance um, contract to the partner or the customer uh, so that as they upgrade and if they decide that they want to upgrade every six months um, or if they have a build and, and something needs to be done, um, you know, if they run into any issues with based upon the original code, you know, we'll fix it. And so that as they upgrade and if they decide that they want to upgrade every six months um, or if they have a build and, and something needs to be done, um, you know, if they run into any issues with based upon the original code, you know, we'll fix it and give it back to them. And it's a, it's a fixed cost and they don't have to worry about, you know, what's going on. Right. Um, you know, just that's you know, huge. They, yeah, yeah. To me, it's an insurance policy, right? I just want yeah. a phone number to call or support case that uh, whose neck I get to ring if it's broken. Right. It, it looks great on GitHub. I download it. I tried it. It worked. But I, I need someone, you know, to be there for me in case it stops working. That's great. Yeah. So, you know, like like the smart sheet, like smart sheets out there. Um, it's not purchasable. You know, you can't purchase it. It's free open source, right? The same thing with like with Adobe Sign and, and so forth and DocuSign. All that stuff is out there. People can use it. Um, but if they want, you know, if they have any problems, they want support or, or they they find that there's an issue with it, you know, they can, they can. They can contact customization services team and uh, we can provide uh, an annual insurance program for them, right? If you want to call it insurance, we call it support and maintenance, but um, it is, like you said, it's an insurance to them, but it's more, and I want to say it's more than insurance because when they upgrade, there's probably something that needs to be done because the product's changing, right? And so we'll make sure that it's compatible with whatever version that they are going to upgrade to also. That's cool. Yeah. I guess I'm, I'm thinking like a CFO there, right? I, Insurance uh, is, is sure. the word that comes to mind from a CFO standpoint. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's, you know, it's, I, and I, and I see where you're coming from. I, you know, I look as insurance as more one of those necessary evils that I don't really ever, yeah, hopefully there's no I never, benefit at all, <laughs> which I actually hopefully never have to use. Right. Um, that's true. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> so it's yeah, like, here, I'm going to give insurance. you a bunch of money. Yeah. I'm, here's, here's a bunch of money I'm going to pay every month, but, and I really hope I don't have to use it, but I'm really mad that I'm having to pay this. Right. But <laughs> that's a good point. Oh <laughs> so, yeah. So I, I, I'm having to pay this. Right. But <laughs> that's a good point. Oh <laughs> so, yeah. So I, it's more maintenance and support. Right. Cause you are going to, you are going to use it. Um, most likely on an annual basis, realistically, because there are enough changes and there's definitely, there tends to be sometimes small, sometimes, you know, bigger, um, you know, like when we, as a team, as we change from approval, you know, just sort of our um, workflows into the auto, you know, from automation steps now into workflows, um, you know, a lot of the customizations that we did on distribution and 
um, finance, there was a lot of work that we had to do. And um, those Ooh, that were on those that, point. those that those that were on maintenance, um, it more i can guarantee it more than paid for itself um those that yeah, were not i could see that it, it almost got to the point it was it was actually cheaper to rewrite it than it was to upgrade it yeah that makes sense that's a huge change out of me appreciate uh reaching out to me and asking me i you know it's been it's been i, I enjoy talking about acumac i enjoy talking about just erp systems and customizations and tools and you know it's you know, I've been in the industry for quite a while and, and there's definitely a passion. And I know you sort of have that passion, but more around reporting, but, uh, you know, I think you've done a really good job with this podcast and it's, uh, you know, congratulations to the success. And, um, you know, again, if there's any other topics, as we were talking about earlier before we started, you know, I'm, I'm more than happy to jump on and I'm happy to talk about almost anything. Well, that'd be great. Maybe, uh, in 2022, I can get you back on for a just fast track and nothing but fast track. How about that? Definitely. Yeah. We can, we can definitely, we might need to block out more than an hour, but yeah, we'll, we'll try <laughs> to get good. it. We'll, we'll get it blocked into an hour so that we don't bore everybody to death. <laughs> no, sounds great. What I love about these is, you know, you're on the phone. I know a lot and a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations and, uh, and, uh, and for Ness sounds good. <laughs> we'll, we'll get it blocked into an hour so that we don't bore everybody to death. <laughs> no, sounds great. What I love about these is, you know, you're on the phone. I know a lot and a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations and, uh, and, uh, and for necessary reasons and specific things. Right. But I think I'm sure you find there's a lot of things that you're regurgitating over and over again. And, and that's what I like about these podcast episodes it just gives a, a chance to put it out there. And I'm also starting to put these on YouTube. So to me, the, the main reason there's no video, but that you can actually link to a specific part of the conversation with the YouTube video. So then, you know, you just have you can send someone a link and oh, just listen to the five minutes you know, right at the link that I click you. And yeah, you know, it just saves you from having to jump on the, that same conversation phone call you know, over and over and over again. Sure. So, yeah. No, cool. I, you know, that I, I, we, we find that we're doing that a lot more just internally, you know, now, you know, we use teams and uh, we find it works and it's specific enough. Um, it doesn't have a whole lot of other things that maybe we can't share sometimes, you know, we try to use those things and then that way we don't have those repeated conversations. Like you said, um, you know, I do talk about things over and over and again, and it always has a little bit different flavor, but, you know, I, I enjoy those conversations because you get that, it's that whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's one on, you know, multiple people, um, you know, we've gotten away, especially over this last two years, everybody's sort of been so far apart, the interaction and, and being able to, you know, back and forth as, as you have through, you and I have through this whole conversation, you know, that, that's the fun part, just sort of hearing what you've experienced and, and vice versa and just sort of sharing stories. Totally agree. That's awesome. Well, close enough to Thanksgiving here that I'll say happy Thanksgiving and uh, thanks again for taking the time and coming on. Well, thank you, Tim. Appreciate it. And happy Thanksgiving to you and your family and Merry, Merry Christmas. And happy new year while we're at it. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right. I'll see you. All right. Bye, Tim. All right. Well, that's it for now. We'll catch you on the next episode of AUGforums.com.